Hello everybody, welcome back. Um, in uh, for our for our fourth episode of examining the witness, in a previous episode we talked about the symmetry area, and uh, and one of the things I mentioned was about how the the witness is relatively unique among modern games in actually doing all of its reflections in an optically correct way by mirroring the uh, the uh, above ground 3D models and just kind of copy pasting them in a special way so that they uh, so that you're you're you get all of the correct uh, reflections as they would uh, would be according to geometry, which is obviously symbolically uh, kind of metaphorically very useful to the symmetry area um, and shows up in a few of those uh, rock reflection puzzles and the reflection puzzles for uh, some of the environmental uh, paths and so it's very important to the game but uh, but it becomes even more important in this next area that we're going to talk about today. Um, and it's a sort of a twin to the symmetry area that takes its ideas a little bit off the page. The symmetry is all about, it's a little bit of a two-dimensional, um, but uh, today we're going to talk about the, the desert and the mechanic or theme of the desert uh, is sort of specular reflection um, uh, and yeah, so there it is. It's uh, it's a it's a beautiful part of the map. It's of course much sparser than the usual like very dense environments of the witness. Um, it's also located way across the map from it's it's far away from everything. It's particularly far away from the mountain, um, and we'll talk about why that is uh, later on. Um, but I just want to lead right in with the uh, with the starting mechanic. Uh, now, this isn't the new player's experience because, as a new player, you wander out here, you putz around the temple, and uh, if you're like me, it just doesn't make that much sense. Uh, you you don't you don't happen to chance upon uh, any clues of, about the about the main mechanic, um, and uh, then you just head off to the rest of the island, and it's very easy once you've you know, it's because this area is so isolated. It's easy to just not come back here until uh, you know much later in the game. Um, so the, I mean, yeah. I guess we'll I guess we'll talk about the mechanic first. Um, we got this fun little flower here. There are some flowers in other areas. There's one that makes an X shape by the windmill. There's um, there's a pair of them by the. Uh, by the doors of the glass house in the symmetry area. Um, these are just, there were some early sort of conspiracy theories, like what do the flowers mean? Um, but they all just kind of have a, 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 a they're, they're sort of cute little nods to the game mechanic of each location. <laughs> in this case, we have an ordinary flower, and then we have this nice plank of wood, which looks like a plain plank of wood from the side, but then it, it lights up in this very unusual way, right? Um, so I uh, uh, one of the so I was talking earlier about the graphics technology of the uh, reflections that are used. Uh, interesting thing about the witness, it's of course it's a game that's about uh, reality, and many of the puzzle mechanics have to do with uh, uh, pro ideas of projection and uh, angles and. Uh, reflection and symmetries that are mathematical symmetries like we see in the symmetry island but also uh, th things that are just kind of intrinsic to the nature of human vision and living in a three-dimensional world but uh, th this sort of specular reflection has a specific uh, it's it's a, a special especially uh, it would be especially familiar to Jonathan Blow and the uh, programmers working on the witness because it's a very important part of graphics technology. Um, things are things are materials uh, are defined as having uh, having a certain amount of in addition to their their texture and color. Um, they'll have a you can define the the reflectivity of an object by giving it a certain amount of absorptivity. A material that's perfectly absorptive would just appears black. Um, and uh, diffuse reflectivity, which is like most of these matte-colored, non-shiny objects have a high diffuse reflectivity. That means light hits it and then it bounces off in every way. So a material that's perfectly diffusely ref reflective it would just look like a white piece of paper. Um, and then there's uh, there's uh, 
specular reflection, um, which we can see here in the sand, right? The witness is always finding ways to tie in the, uh, the themes of the game to uh, every aspect of the art direction. Um, so you can see, you know, in the symmetry area, it's everything is just reflecting off of a flat plane. But now we have spectral reflection, even though it's a lot less beautiful, things are getting a lot more complex, right? The sun is, the sun is up here, and we don't just have reflections of the sun, we, we have them like coming off at angles um, because this hill is at an angle. Um, so that, uh, that specular reflection is an important part of graphics technology, and, and of course it, it's an important part of uh, how objects uh, shine in the real world. Um, so that's what this area is all about. Uh, but then there's the, the question of why this theming, why uh, uh, why this ancient ruins, um, and I think uh, it's the other thing that strikes me about this uh, this place is it's so it's such a primordial uh, landscape. We'll we'll talk about this a little later, but um, it's the the ruins. There, this is clearly the one of the oldest. Uh, parts of the island, whoever inhabited this place, uh, whatever the, the different architecture styles are supposed to stand for, um, this was clearly, in a sense, the first. Long ago, this was the center of all the scientific effort, and now it's all the way across the island over there on the mountain. Um, so we'll talk about what that means, but uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, so we'll just get in on some of these puzzles. So we see this seemingly totally indecipherable thing, except uh, there's a little bit of specular. And if you're lucky enough to catch it, then you can catch a glimpse of it. Interestingly, even from this very first one, I think this is the the only one that we can uh, that we can do right now. Um, it's uh, you still have to apply a little bit of deduction, even though this is the sort of um, more of a clue hidden in the environment, or you know, less of a logic syntax, uh, you know, that the, the solution's immediately apparent. Um, but uh, it's still kind of tricky. The exact spot that you'd want to stand is, is a little bit obscured by this uh, rock. But there we go. And of course, we immediately start getting into some of the complexities. Because all of these panels share the same uh, shape. There's some like fun little uh, process of elimination that can go, and that'll become very elaborated in these later puzzles. Here we see the one side, and then we've got to put that together with the other side. Was it like this? Ooh, no, okay. I messed up. Okay, I'll do a better job of remembering this time. Alrighty. So, uh, so these these individual puzzles are uh, are based on um, this specular reflection principle, but the the temple as well is clearly a sun temple. It's aligned in the direction of the sun, um, and uh, and it has these these special reflective patterns out here, which can in fact be used to complete a number of charming environmental puzzles. There's one. And then, uh, where's the other one gonna be? It's a little bit... a little bit tilted this way. So, there we go. Just follow this line backwards. Uh, is 
that going to work out for us? Where are we going to get our sunlight from? Okay, we're going to have to come in. There we go. So, the intersection of these two. Um, and of course, in addition to being able to complete the puzzles, we can see that this this is a, a mural, right? This is a sun icon, and it also um, it bears very close resemblance, very close resemblance, to the logo that we see on the um, on 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 like the the little pillow over there, and the things in the um, the things in the starting castle, all that kind of hotel type stuff has a logo that's super close to this, which is really interesting because, of course, this is this is going to be a symbol of some kind of uh, very ancient people's kind of like sun worship, uh, early primitive religion. Um, and uh, so, so whoever is kind of uh, providing this hotel experience is, is calling all the way back to the earliest civilizations of the Witness. Um, and as we saw, of course, you know, in the real world, the sun might just be a... a you know, nuclear fusion hydrogen ball, but in the witness, the sun is an appropriate object of veneration, uh, being round as it is and able to produce uh, s such a spectacular uh, environmental puzzle. Um, that uh, that this, you know, this in 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 any other game, uh, sun worship would not mean the same thing that it does in the witness. Here, uh, this this early religion is all you know from the get go. This isn't some group that that believed in some like a uh, strange uh punishing fatherly god that was just a metaphor for uh you know tribal unity or something these people are going for the goal straight away um they they want that full understanding of the universe um they want that that uh that kind of fundamental knowledge of uh of consciousness and uh and scientific information about the world sort of brought together for that complete picture that the witness is trying to gesture towards. Um, while we're out here, I suppose we can look at a few more places that, that reflects like who these people were who built this thing. This is uh, another little reflection puzzle, um, but uh, but we also... Uh, this is This is a... Uh, clearly, li like that sort of Stonehenge construction over here, um, this is reminiscent of a lot of naked eye observatory structures. Um, you can look up, or I'll put a, a link in the u video description, uh, links to the uh, Jantar Mantar in India, um, and there are a lot of naked eye observatories around the world. They kind of look like giant sundials. This was uh, this curves up, and then you know this would have been curved up on the other side, and you can use that to measure the positions of the stars accurately, do like accurate time telling and things like that. And so this this theme of early astronomy, astronomy of course being one of the first sciences mastered by real world ancient peoples, the Egyptians and the Babylonians made like very accurate uh, predictions. The Mayans are also famous astronomers. Uh, it's an appropriate place to to represent that first stirrings of both religious feeling in the form of sort of sun worship and uh, scientific curiosity uh, from this early astronomy. So we'll listen to this quote here, which is related to that. I maintain that the cosmic religious feeling is the strongest and noblest motive for scientific research. Only those who realize the immense efforts and, above all, the devotion without which pioneer work in theoretical science cannot be achieved, are able to grasp the strength of the emotion out of which alone such work, remote as it is from the immediate realities of life, can issue. What a deep conviction of the rationality of the universe, and what a yearning to understand, were it but a feeble reflection of the mind revealed in this world, Kepler and Newton must have had to enable them to spend years of solitary labor in disentangling the principles of celestial mechanics. Those whose acquaintance with scientific research is derived chiefly from its practical results easily develop a completely false notion of the mentality of the men who, surrounded by a skeptical world, have shown the way to kindred spirits scattered wide through the world and through the centuries. 
Only one who has devoted his life to similar ends can have a vivid realization of what has inspired these men and given them the strength to remain true to their purpose in spite of countless failures. It is cosmic religious feeling that gives a man such strength. A contemporary has said, not unjustly, that in this materialistic age of ours, the serious scientific workers are the only profoundly religious people. Albert Einstein, 1930. So, uh, of course, uh, Einstein sort of uh, came towards the end, or I, I suppose there have been plenty of big cosmological discoveries after after uh, Einstein, actually, even even recently in the 90s. But uh, but calling back to Newton and Kepler. Um, the uh, the sort of foundational astronomy of, of where we are in the world um, is uh, what these ancient people were clearly kind of striving after. But let's pick up a few more puzzles. All right, so now that we've got puzzles way up there, we've got to think a little bit more about the angles of the sun, and this becomes. So the reason I say this is a twin to the symmetry area is that, uh, of course, a, a beam of light reflecting, like I'm looking up at this panel right now at the same angle that the sun is looking down at this panel because uh, it hits the panel. The uh, uh, There's sort of a half angle there uh, is the, the, I mean, hard to explain in words, uh, but uh, but the the math of reflection involves a lot of three-dimensional symmetry. Now I gotta sneak around this rock. in order to get this one, what this is saying is, okay, so it's tilted to the one side, the light's going to come in, it's going to bounce off this way, it's going to bounce off this way, then here, the light's coming in, and uh, because this is tilted down, it's going to it's gonna bounce off like that, so you've got to get really up close to it in order to see, and now we have this one, we can turn it to face the sun, of course. Um, oh, is that going to stop? Maybe it won't stop. Um, but because it's tilted so far upwards, we're going to have to find the steepest place that we can to look down on it. Should be coming into frame soon. Oh no, wait, I could be right there. Uh oh. This isn't gonna be good enough. Oh yes it will, okay. There we go. Alright, so it looks like that was that's close to um facing right onto the sun. So now we have the light because uh, my shadow is right here. So we have the light coming right from the sun, bouncing straight off it perpendicular like a mirror, and then coming right back to me. This is also a kind of interesting union of, it's unlike the apple trees where it's kind of, there's a reference to coordinate systems and binary trees and things like that, but there's no, um, uh, there, you know, you can kind of just look at the trees and for some of the other mechanics like the, the shady forest and, uh, other places, you can just, um, pick up on the rules, uh, it's, it's sort of less uh, rigidly mathematical. Uh, this is an interesting crossover point because the way that you as the player can solve the puzzles, you're kind of just going around, you're like finagling your viewpoint, um, and then you see this path and you just fill it in, and yet it, it on, in another sense it is one of those rigidly mathematical puzzles because 
there is uh, there's these very precise angles going on um, behind all of this. Oh, before we go down into this very um, like King Tut's tomb kind of uh, kind of like very foreboding opening here, let's go visit this other sundial experience. <laughs> this one is interesting. It's a it's a, a projection puzzle that we can't get from here. Of course, it's another one. Uh, kind of reflecting the sun, and again, reflecting the sun in order to create uh, a a a projection puzzle, an environmental puzzle, is uh, just like the sun worship. I mean, that's that's indicative of it's sort of an early gesture towards what happens over there in the castle fortress, where uh, uh, where you have the the sort of harnessing the power of the sun. Um, that this is like this early grasp, even though they're just reflecting, um, it's uh, it's it's kind of uh, from the very beginning. These people on the island, they know where the target is, even though it's very early days and they and they have a long way to go. <laughs> this m mural I find very beautiful. So partly this is just a little clue. Here's here's the boat. Um, you can take the boat around the island, and that's the only perspective that is uh, that's far enough out there in order to complete this puzzle. But that's not what I find interesting about it. What I find interesting about it is, is right this, uh, right here. So this is a representation of what we're standing on right now. You see this, this long kind of ruler, and then these two posts at the end. Um, this It's missing its post. It's like fallen into the ocean or something. Um, but, uh, but you can see over there uh, the other side of, of what was once this big structure. Um, so it's this kind of cute self-representation, and what makes that interesting is that on this structure, which which is itself meant to capture the glare of the sun, you see a depiction of the sun and then the glare of the sun. Uh, and of course, the sun is bigger and brighter and more real. So these people knew that they weren't, you know, they weren't capturing the power of the sun. They were just having this kind of pale reflection of it. Um, the reason why that seems like a kind of uh, interesting and, and resonant uh, topic to me is uh, is b the famous um, uh, Plato allegory of the cave where Plato talks about how everything in the world in his philosophy is uh, is just a sort of reflection of something in a from from the realm of the forms a sort of purer world where where concepts uh, have these uh, this idealized reality to them, which was actually more real than our world. And he would say that our world is to the world of the forms the way that, uh, the way that like shadows are to objects, or reflections and puddles are to real objects. Um, and so this, uh, this, this panel seems to suggest not just that the, that the ancient people here liked the sun, but that they, they had that sense of allegorical thinking and uh, and representational thinking and that they understood what they were doing here of course I mean they built all these things meant to meant to reflect the Sun at precise angles um, but they understood uh, these ideas of of representation um, and uh, and depth versus flatness and uh, and the kind of that kind of Platonist idea of how how concepts can uh, uh, can manifest themselves in the world. Um, so I thought that was a very key little mural here because we don't have much from these ancient people. Who knows why they lived here on the island and why they disappeared. So here we go, we're down in this vault. The roof has partially fallen in. And that's good for us, because otherwise, I don't know how we'd solve these. Ah, so in both of these, we're not given full information. Above, we're just thinking about the sun. and uh, But now we're gonna have to get some lights. It's gonna shine a little bit of light on this, uh, but but I'm gonna have to start thinking about the angles instead of just reflexively relying on the sun. 
There we go. So we're coming down there. coming from this direction. Now nicely these are all right behind column because I mean of course they're they're intended to partially shade these so they only give you a, a small amount of information about the overall panel but it also provides a good visualization of the path of the light, the angle that the light takes. So we see the angle of the light strikes like this so it's going to be shining like that. So I'm going to start there and end up like that. Now this one is very tricky. I recall that this uh, relies on getting a tiny peak uh, from all three lights. Fortunately, this one is easier because these are at funny angles, but this is at just at the ground, so you, ha you can be right in line with the light because all of the angles and bouncing is happening in, uh, in the vertical direction. This uh, this multi-story thing is uh, uh, it's it's an interesting structure for the game, um, and uh, it's also very reminiscent. It's a, another kind of uh, callback to uh, to the structure of some of these ancient tombs. The uh, this you know you're going down, you're like unearthing uh, you know is it is it going to be a, a some tomb or some treasure down there? Um, uh, it feels much like the the false ceilings and false floors of the Egyptian temples um, where they would try and um, prevent the temples from being ransacked by putting a sequence of, of ceilings but then the, the real treasure would be up above a couple of fake ceilings. So now we're in here, we no longer have the sun, so the light is no longer coming in kind of parallel from infinitely far away, but it's coming from this point source uh, in the same room, so that provides a little bit of variation and of course we've got some water now so we can start playing multiple reflection games instead of just bouncing off the panels now we can have this sort of two point turns um, in this case we can't get low enough to see this panel um, we can only just barely catch the top but thanks to the water we can get it interestingly it is not possible to draw on the panels through the reflection. Uh, did I mess that up? Yes. So, uh, like, <laughs> it's very easy to mess up the left and right here, um, which, uh, I mean, feels, feels frustrating because it's so easily uh, corrected that you can barely stop to think about it, but of course that's another way of prodding the player to start thinking about all these symmetries. You, you know, you're, you're looking down here because this is the one that's showing you the solution, and, uh, and you're, you sort of just have to trace the line, but you've got to think, oh, wait a second, like, up and down... Are, uh, are reversed here, but left and right are not reversed. Um, I've got this last puzzle, which we only have this tiny pool of water to work with, so we're going to have to piece it together. Alright, and this, this I suppose forces it, maybe because we're so close, 
we can't get them both on screen at the same time. These others, we could do that trick of just, just watching and tracing ourselves, but now we've got to be a little bit smart. We've got to look down, and so right after I was I was thinking, I was like, oh, I'll just mindlessly trace these, um, but now, uh, now we've got to think, like, okay, that's at the top, so really we want to start at the bottom, and then we're going to go up and take a bite out. Uh, like that. There we go. And there's always that funny moment when the there's uh, the light is so um, there's not much light down here, so the reflection is very uh, pure. You just see these above ground things, but then when the power lines light up, then you can see that they're actually lying a couple feet below the water, um, which is just a kind of surprising reminder that uh, oh yeah, there's uh, there's there's depth down there too. Um, it's not just a mirror. Um, by the way, uh, astute witness players might have noticed that I'm passing by some of the environmental puzzles. Like, uh, there's uh, one of these that, you know, you're looking at this and you're like, oh, how's it going to work? You know, I can't get low enough. Um, so you see that you can try and complete the reflection here or get way back there. Maybe there's some way of uh, sneak it in there. Very funny to sneak it in between these between these two tiny things. Definitely a joke there. Um, so that's a fun little sequence of, uh, of two puzzles. Um, but, uh, uh, oh, and I, I love how it zooms out the bottom. It's like zooming out out of here and out of this exit down there. That's, that's a lot of fun. Um, but, uh, uh, but I, you know, we, we, aren't, we aren't doing all of them. Like, uh, s some of the environmental puzzles just... Um, some of them have a specific uh, kind of identifiable uh, theme or tie-in, but uh, some of them do, to me at least, maybe I just haven't recognized the theme of a lot of them. Um, like I was going to I was gonna pass over that one before I uh, remembered what was going on with it. Um, but some of the environmental puzzles do seem like they're just kind of, like they just couldn't pass up the opportunity to do it because the art would have been so cool. Um, but not making a specific thematic or game design point. All right, let's see about this. So this is shining. This is kind of complicated. I think we're going to be over on the other side. This is going to come down, bounce off here, bounce off the water, and then come out through this rock somehow. There we go. So we're going to start on the top, go around the side. Now we're deeper under here, and uh, so one thing that uh, that it, this is a little bit out of order, um, but uh, but one thing that we'll see here, all of a sudden the panels are blue, right? Um, and which you might think it's like, oh, you know, we're we're underwater now or something. Um, and of, of course, the fact that there's more and more water in each chamber is is a very uh, very kind of uh, complementary, like like well done uh, design choice because it adds difficulty and interest to add more water because there's more possibility for reflections. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's it's also just geographically realistic. We're going down to like closer to the water table, um, so it would make sense that we'd see all this stuff. <laughs> okay, I gotta start thinking here. So we've got light here, coming over this panel. It's gonna bounce like that down there. I think you'd have to be like very close in order to in order to catch that. Oh, but this is the old yield lowering the water. There we go. That'll that'll make it much more. One other thing that I think the, uh, these, like, why are the reflection panels, why is this all, uh, I can see that one, but this one's still coming up. There we go.
Uh, uh, my left and right. So, uh, so as you can see, these, um, these puzzles are, uh, oh, and this is super funny. Okay, so this key only shows up when the water recedes, which is natural. You don't need to push the water up when it's already high up. Um, but it's positioned such as to be an exact reflection. Uh, you know, it's, uh, this, uh, th there we can see the reflection of the two of them. But when the water rises up, then this will still be uh, visible in a sense, it's just that we'll, we'll have stopped seeing the actual object and we'll just be seeing the uh, reflection in the form of this key. Clever game as usual. <laughs> but uh, another thing that I think ties the theme of reflection to this uh, to these kind of ancient um, caverns besides the uh, besides the connection to astronomy and the sun worship um, and the kind of Platonic Platonism idea of um, of seeing um, of like first mastering that that idea of reflection as a metaphor for for representation. Um, so in addition to all that, uh, I when I was a kid, I remember reading some books about the temples in Egypt. Um, and I think there was a theory for some time, uh, of course some of the temples in Egypt are lined up with the sun, there's a famous one that, you know, it has this long corridor and when the sun goes down at a certain time of uh, the year, some special uh, holiday or solstice or something, then it would shine through and illuminate the statues and things within. And uh, uh, Egyptian archaeologists have uh, sometimes wondered with those temples, like how did they do, because the Egyptians would paint these beautiful murals, there's interestingly no no murals or signs of paint or anything, except maybe the room has been painted white. Um, and uh, so the archaeologists would wonder like, oh, how did they paint these uh, these interior spaces? You could bring in torches, but then there'd be so much smoke that it would uh, kind of cloud up the uh, the ceilings and mess up all the murals. Um, and so for, for a period of time, one of the theories was that uh, the ancient Egyptians would use bronze mirrors and they'd reflect light and then reflect it again and get it to shine down all of these like long hallways when they were carving these temples into uh, into the rock. Um, so to me that that stood out as like, oh yeah, it's just, you know, clearly the themes of reflection kind of tie in to, uh, to the, the uh, ancient primitive uh, temples. But uh, I, th I think at some point I looked that up and I discovered that that had like long been discredited as a theory. Um, so don't go around telling people that the Egyptians actually built temples in that way. But I, I do think that that uh, maybe was a famous enough image. And in some shows like Indiana Jones, they, they show uh, uh, Indy is, um, is sort of... Uh, working on, uh, lights up some temples using mirrors and things like that, so there's some kind of a cultural connection there between reflections and, uh, ancient temples. Alright, this is not working out for me. Oh, this is horrible. No, 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 this is tilted so much. This is going to come in at this extreme angle. See, it's, it's not going to hit and bounce off, uh, like as if it was flat. It's going to come in like here. The, the line perpendicular to the mirror is that, so that angle is just going to be reflected. It's going to come in like that and then bounce off the water. No, no, this has got to be raised. Horrible. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what else we've got around here. We've got one over there. And uh, then I think there's some that are like way over here. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one, a floating one, but we'll come to those later. Definitely an interesting progression of uh, atmosphere and ambiance. Um, oh, no, now I can't see it. Okay, okay. There we go, got a little bit lucky. Okay, oh, now we have one that's uh, underwater. So the light is not, uh, it's not gonna uh, be able to get on it. We're gonna have to lower the water so that the light can go like bounce here, then down into the water, and then back up. And I guess I'll pick it up from the other side. Um, looking down on it, where could I see that reflection? 
Yeah, maybe somewhere in here we'll see a reflection right down there. Hopefully. There is a, uh, a nice environmental puzzle around here somewhere. Oh, I missed it already. Uh, but I can't complete it from here because I've got a little scaffolding. It's forcing me to remember. All right, I think I've got it. So one thing, um, you know, uh, this this is the first time in in the witness in this uh, playthrough, episode by episode, that I've seriously run into the problem of not being able to, I mean, earlier they've had places where there's literally something like a little latch covering, like in the starting castle garden, a latch covering part of the puzzle, so you just kind of run into it, but that has a different character to it than standing halfway across the map and thinking like, uh, thinking, hey, I sh you know, I should be able to draw this, and then realizing, oh yeah, there's stuff in the way. Um, and uh, that... Uh, that feels appropriate that uh, you, we'll see, I mean, that, it's not just an accident that this scaffolding was here. Um, we'll see later on in the, uh, in this, uh, in this area that we, they, they, they deliberately introduce, uh, some, some puzzles where you have to sign a, kind of get around the little bits of rebar and other obstacles in order to, to simply draw on the puzzle. Um, which the reason why that's brought up here, I think, is twofold. The first is the practical reason that uh, in this area you're you're drawing while you're looking at the panel. These panels are larger; they're like oversized uh, uh, plus versions um, compared to the standard panels. Um, and they also uh, you're you're drawing on them from far away uh, because you're standing in these special locations in order to catch the reflection. Um, and so then, then you start thinking about your position relative to the panel becomes very important. And then, so that's a natural place to introduce not just reflection, but also occlusion by physical objects. All right, here we go. We happen to have this one because we have the light coming from over here. I guess, did that just turn on? Was that not on before? And anyway, we can get to this, this floating panel now. I guess, the, you know, you got to have one that's floating in the, uh, in the water just to kind of uh, act as a reminder of... Uh, just to emphasize all the geometry that's happening with the light bouncing off the water. I guess it would be easy to kind of sleepwalk through these sections and just be like, oh yeah, move it up and down until you see the light coming through here thinking about the light bouncing off of the panels, but not really thinking about the, the two-point reflection of the light bouncing off the water. Um, and so by putting a vertical one down there, you're, uh, you're, you're bringing that uh, uh, reflection uh, on the panels and reminding players, like, hey, this has been going on the whole time in all these puzzles, of course. Um, now, bear with me, because I don't quite remember how this one goes, and I remember it's a little bit complex. Uh, so we've got the the shadows of the columns, and interestingly, just, just like in the previous room, we have two slightly different colors of light, um, and then those cast two different shadows. Um, so uh, so we got to work out how that goes. How are we going to see the reflection there? Um, so this light is coming from that direction, so we're, if we're going to see a reflection, we're going to have to stand over there. It. And and it's facing down, and the light is up there, so we'll have to probably raise the water level, unless there's some way that we can really see it from all the way across the map. But that that seems unlikely. I bet for this light, because it's lower and at a lower angle, maybe maybe for this light we'll have to see it with the lower water level. Let's check it out. Yeah, there we go. Uh, hard to make out exactly what's happening there, though. Let's raise it.
There we go. Okay, so let's put those two together. Although we still have to see the very start, but I, I guess we know the start. Just, uh, all right. Nope. All right. Hmm. Let me put this together. I've got a little piece of paper here. I'm drawing it out. Working on it for you guys. lower this one more time then we'll be out of this room I promise <laughs> maybe if we're close we can catch the early reflection uh, likely So I know how the end goes. I'm gonna end up going uh, through through there, uh, through there. This is going to work. Okay. Um, oh, is this going to be the end of the, the blue? All right. So one thing that I just wanted to note here, and we'll talk about more about this later, um, I mentioned this blue color. Versus, uh, you'll remember that in the uh, in the previous room, and up above, we always had this orange color. Um, and as you remember from the symmetry area, we, we had a kind of uh, a kind of yellow and blue thing going on there too. Although these are these are darker, fuller colors, uh, which to me is a, a little bit reminiscent of the the added difficulty of this level. I once heard Jonathan Blow uh, on some kind of a stream refer to. Uh, this whole side of the island, the, the intro castle, the symmetry area, the apple orchard, and this reflection zone as the easy side of the island, which I think it is. Um, but the reflection zone is, uh, is in, in some ways, it's, it's kind of a harder version of, of symmetry world uh, in terms of theme, although the puzzles aren't that similar. Um, so we have this, uh, this orange versus blue, uh, which mimics the... Uh, the sort of yellow and cyan of uh, of the symmetry area um, but there's a closer pairing than just uh, orange blue to yellow cyan which is that we see the the pretty much the exact same orange and blue um, in the marsh area where which we haven't done an episode on yet, but uh, we'll see it later later in this episode because we'll complete the Feynman Vault. Um, and there, the blue represents a kind of negative space uh, or background, and the uh, yellowy orange represents uh, positive space and foreground. Um, so again, that yellow-blue combination is uh, still tied to the ideas of symmetry, but it's given this specific association with 
foreground versus background, positive space versus negative space, uh, and also in the marshes above water versus below water. Um, so it's kind of nice that once we get down here to below the water table, all of a sudden we're getting these um, these bluish underwater uh, uh, themed puzzles. Now we're into this final area, which is fortunately a little less brutally difficult than some of those puzzles in there, but um, but it's so fun. <laughs> Alright, so we'll start right here. We get uh, curved panels, one of the few places in the witness, except the cylindrical ones, where we see curved panels. Of course, there's such a striking disparity between this reflection that rushes right by um, and this that, uh, that slowly eases its way across the map. Um, and uh, it's just... I don't really know what to say about that. It's just the the geometry of reflection. Um, uh, if if these were, um, you know, if if the witness had come out in 2019, where we've got our NVIDIA RTX ray trace graphics, um, then they could have had a, a genuine uh, ray tracing going on instead of the mirroring. The ray tracing is a sort of new graphics technology that that gives optically correct results, um, but uh, but you could you could use it for curved surfaces versus the witness's trick of um, of just mirroring the geometry upside down would not work for curved surfaces, which is why on the sand outside we have a special shader that produces the the um, specular reflection effect. But you could never do like detailed images um, like you get in real life. So <laughs> if this was um, uh, if these were both mirrors, then this would actually produce images. Uh, like mirror images that that seem smaller, I think, than an ordinary mirror, and and seemed uh, kind of located behind the mirror. Versus, if you have a curve like this, then you actually produce images that have this kind of odd holographic feel. Um, you can you can get a sense for this if you play with a bathroom mirror, um, and uh, and stand far enough back from it, you get some kind of funny effects uh, where it seems like you're holding your finger out to the bathroom scale, and there's like an image of your finger that seems to be kind of coming out of the mirror. Um, hard to explain, but it's uh, uh, this is sort of being referenced here is the idea of of uh, uh, as they call them real versus virtual images. I mean they're kind of both virtual, but but the technical term in optics is real versus virtual images, um, depending on which way your your reflective surface is curving. So it's nice to see that show up in the witness. Okay, there we go. <laughs> So here we have to. Oh, aye, aye, aye. There. Um, for here, we've got to pivot around here because the focal point of this mirror is behind us. It's in the middle of the rock wall. You can imagine the where the center of a of a sphere or a cylinder would be. Um, versus here, if we just uh, you know if we stand at the proper place, uh, the light isn't quite positioned correctly. But uh, but we get we get a much wider. In addition to the fact that it zips across our field of view, notice how much wider it is than uh, than this narrow band of reflection. So we can see practically the the whole puzzle at the same time. Um, although maybe there's some difficulty with catching the the lower edge. There we go. Um, here we have just represented in one puzzle all of the difficulty of, again, there's got to be a lot of movement here and you get only a narrow band for the same reason uh, that we get over here. Um, uh, in one puzzle, kind of a combination of what previously was multiple puzzles uh, stacked at different orientations. And now we can kind of see the, the mechanism is revealed. You know, before we might have been kind of... Uh, confused, I mean, having played this before and thought about the, the um, geometry of reflection, um, uh, it's, it's easy to kind of walk through where the light should be and where it's coming from, but, uh, but if you're first encountering this as a new player, then it can be quite confusing, like, why is standing here giving me this reflection and not somewhere else? Um, and so you come into this room, it's a much more interactive room, it's less like lock and key, like you find the single magic angle and there's no reflection anywhere else. Um, <coughs> And uh, it's more like you get to kind of play around by uh, 
going uh, going to different places. first. Silly me. <laughs> oh. Ah. It's a little turn there. Tricky, tricky. And now... The, oh, uh, we've unlocked one, but not all of the latches. We've got another sequence to complete. <laughs> so this, like I was, like I was referencing again, is another uh, one where they're they're introducing the kind of uh, trick obstacles here, um, and it's a glass panel, which makes me feel like yeah, the trick is going to be coming right behind the glass panel where you can complete uh, complete the puzzle uninterrupted. Um, it's kind of a shame. It feels like glass and reflections. Uh, you know, would have been a really nice, um, uh, really nice. It does it does really make you wish for a, a ray traced version of the witness? Um, because you know, then you could add mirrors, you could add all kinds of craziness, and uh, with glass, I mean, who knows? Like tinted colored glass, you could have really gone crazy. Okay. So we're just gonna want to come over there and make a little zigzag and come down. And then this is an interesting one because just like how I was saying this is like multiple panels in one, well, this is uh, one panel, but uh, spread out uh, over time, uh, sort of. Um, so we can uh, we can get maybe a, uh, do we get a tiny glimpse of one of the, or do we have to rotate it? So here, this slow vertical rotation is kind of a mirror to uh, this bent panel over here, which is a lot of fun. So there's a couple of unique things about this laser, um, as we're about to see. <laughs> the first is that it uh, it's totally horizontal. It doesn't aim up toward the mountain. It's completely flat, um, or or nearly flat. Um, the second is that it parallels this underground path. We just we just walked up here, um, and uh, and came along this straight tunnel uh, from uh, from the from the desert temple from the temple ruins. And now look at this little chimneys. We won't be able to get down here until later in the game, but these little uh, chimneys are to uh, bring some air down to the tunnels below. Um, here we have this laser, so close you could touch it. And uh, these chimneys keep going for, for quite a while. There's this long, long underground tunnel, and where does it connect? Well, fortunately, we have this very helpful laser 
that can show us the exact underground path, because the path does continue straight. And uh, we'll notice out here that it goes right over the theater. Um, that that uh, that path there. See there we see coming from coming from the desert temple, and there's the entrance to the theater, uh, which to me means one thing. It means that the people who built the desert temple um, were also the likely uh, can't say for sure, but likely the same people who constructed this uh, theater. Now, of course, they didn't have all the wonderful AV equipment, um, but uh, but the circular underground shape, uh, it reminds me a lot of, of the, uh, I think they're called kivas? Uh, I'm not sure. A sort of Native American uh, religious uh, structure in of the uh, Pueblo Indians in Colorado. They built these kind of circular, uh, recessed underground, not so large as this, but um, kind of recessed underground temples. Um, and uh, some people think like, oh, maybe this was a cistern, you know, and that that's where the town stored their fresh water. They got a lake right there, people. They don't need a cistern. Um, but uh, but I I think uh, whatever it was used for by the later inhabitants of the town, I think this was part of the sun worship, um, especially given the eclipse significance of the theater um, later in the game. But, uh, but I think this was a very important uh, secondary temple, along with their astronomy-based efforts over here. This was a more religious building of theirs um, that, uh, that, you know, you could imagine the, the passage of the sun, if there, was, if there was time in this game, if the sun ever bothered to move, then you would have nice um, kind of uh, the, the shadow uh, or the spotlight cast by the sun would move across this space. Um, it would be a very beautiful ritual space. So that sheds a little bit more light on the, the mystery first civilization of the witness. As, as, as we can see here in the town, um, there were multiple waves of, of people, and we'll talk more about the later ones and, uh, and w you know, what I think they represent, because I think uh, each group does, uh, does bring, have its own philosophical flavor to it. So we get one last street with this laser. Um, which is that it's totally pointed in the wrong direction, like not even trying. Um, and we've got to complete this little. Uh, we've got to get this thing pointed in the, in the correct direction. Let's let's do it first try, okay? So the mountain is that way. You might think point it in the direction of the mountain, but no, no, we got to learn about reflections here. So the laser is coming in from this direction. So the laser is sort of coming on a line that's pointing to this spike. The uh, the mountain is in that direction. Okay, so laser's coming in this way. Mountain's in this way. So we we want the uh, we want the uh, the little reflector to be in this axis uh, because if if the reflector is in this axis, then the uh, the laser light. Oh, let me. It's difficult to trace this. Come on, mouse. Come on. All right. The laser light is going to come in. It's going to bounce off this axis. Um, it's going to be reflected around the the half angle that's perpendicular to the axis, and it's going to shoot out there, which is where we want to, to get the mountain. Now the mountain's also elevated, um, but that's no problem because this thing is tilted at just the right amount to just complete the puzzle. So that's what we're going to we're going to do. We want we want uh, it to be located in this axis. Uh, so we're going to set it to here because I think that's that's where this, uh, how the control scheme works. <laughs> and now we see this wonderful thing, after doing all of these puzzles, where um, where we, shoo, um, after doing all these puzzles where we've been imagining the movement of the light, uh, now all of a sudden we we can see it because we have this magic fantasy laser. Um, so it's a wonderful visualization of this thing that's been invisible the whole time and now it's revealed which uh, brings a particular a particularly uh, interesting symmetry to that symmetry area where I talk so much about the uh, the Nicholas of Cusa co quote talking about the disappearing line that the visible invisible um, quote about the wall of paradise um, over there you had the uh, the sort of blue and yellow line that uh, and the yellow line is, is 
that you that was your friend for so long and you were it was kind of a crutch that you were relying on um, and then the yellow line disappears and you realize wait a second I can do the puzzles just by myself with just the just the blue line because of course I know exactly where the yellow line is going to be because of the symmetry rules um, now we we after spending the whole time playing with these invisible lines and trying to imagine where they are in three dimensions and visualize them all of a sudden it's like a like a relief or like a sort of uh, you know, it's it's this uh, very very interesting uh, uh, revelation to see the actual uh, line. And what do you know? The line kind of glows yellow. It's sort of alternating between uh, blue and yellow, and then we have the blue of the symmetry area. So there's our little blue and yellow theme, uh, which is familiar from the symmetry area, that's kind of linking together these two locations. Um, so. Somewhere around here is a very, very sneaky audio log. There we go. The concept of a clock enfolds all succession in time. In the concept, the sixth hour is not earlier than the seventh or eighth, although the clock never strikes the hour, save when the concept biddeth. Nicholas of Cusa, 1450. So that's an interesting one. Uh, it's uh, for me. It was a bit of a tough nut to crack, uh, and I'm I'm still not sure exactly why it's here and uh, what it what it represents. But I'm always a fan of Kuza. Um, it's sort of the reappearance of of a Kuza quote linked to that. You know, there was a Kuza quote over here talking about the invisibility, and here's another Kuza quote uh, linked to the sort of uh, the, the the surprising visibility of this reflected uh, beam of light. Um, and uh, so, so that's one one thing. Um, of course, this little diagram here looks like a clock, um, and it's controlling the rotation of this thing. It, it is not a clock, but it looks like a clock. Um, so this is sort of drawing. I think the quote is drawing a little bit of attention to the strange fact uh, that 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 the reflection area draws the reflection area as well as a few other places in the game draw very special attention to the fact that time doesn't appear to happen in the witness. Uh, in particular, the sun never moves. None of those puzzles would be completable in a uh, normal game with a day and night cycle because the sun would always be on the move, um, or you'd have to wait for the right time. That could be pretty cool, but um, <laughs> but so you're. It's it's an interesting uh, design choice to have to have this uh, this kind of static world. Um, I think it's necessary, and I think it and necessary for the puzzles certainly, but also necessary for the themes of the game. It, it would have been dishonest, in a sense, to have the sun on, to have the sun rotating, and have as much as I would love to see the island at night with like stars and a full moon and things like that. That would be absolutely beautiful, but um, but it would it would be dishonest in a way to try and portray time moving in a game where everything is so static. Um, there's conspicuously no, there's no life on the island, you know, they, they could have put little tweeting birds and things, but when you're in the trees, and I remember a blog post on the, on the Witness blog, uh, a long time ago, talking about how they were contracting with the audio developers, because they wanted to have a really nice, uh, sounds to, to, uh, create the right atmosphere in the game, and they had to tell these audio people, like, okay, you need to capture the ambiance of a forest, but you're only allowed to use the sounds of trees swaying in the wind and uh, leaves being crunched underfoot and sticks crackling and things like that. No bird calls, which is the standard audio designer language for uh, relaxing forest sounds. So it was, like, a difficult and interesting challenge to figure out how to distinguish all these areas using only these, like, very um, kind of... Uh, uh, very low, um, quiet sounds of, of ambiance that uh, that aren't referencing the kind of animal life you'd usually find around here. Now you might object, like, "Oh, wait, but there are bird sounds, you know, over here in the uh, in the forest area." But that's those are being played on speakers, uh, so it's it's like conspicuous. It's kind of rubbing in your face over there how there there's there's like no living thing. I mean, there's plants, but there's no living animals or people. Um, on uh, on this island, um, and so so having the sun move would be would be a little bit inconsistent with that, and I think the Kusa quote is calling attention to that. Um, but the Kusa quote is also saying something a little bit um, 
I looked up the context for this, and Kusa is using a kind of spatial metaphor to talk about um, to talk about the idea of God living outside of time uh, and living in a kind of eternal time that uh, you know we have the moments coming one after another, um, but uh, God is like kind of looking down on us from like the the fourth dimension or something, and He sort of sees all the time at once, um, which. Uh, that that thought is an interesting thought. It also doesn't seem to have too much of a place in the witness because just because the witness is so everything's so static. There's usually uh, there's there's not many aspects of the game that have to do with time, uh, unlike of course his previous game, Braid. Um, but uh, but I think that that uh, notion of of looking looking down on the universe from a kind of God's eye perspective um, and seeing uh, seeing all of the hours uh, at once um, versus being in that world and uh, and feeling the hours go by and having the future in the past um, that it relates a little bit to the to the ideas of uh, representation and abstraction that we were talking about earlier with uh, Plato and the uh, reflections of the sun. Um, it also uh, relates to... Uh, uh, I forget what I'm going to say. Well, it's an interesting quote. We'll, we'll play it again. So short. The concept of a clock enfolds all succession in time. In the concept, the sixth hour is not earlier than the seventh or eighth, although the clock never strikes the hour, save when the concept biddeth. Nicholas of Cusa, 1450. Uh, maybe the one other thing that I was going to say is that it just brings up again that distinction between the uh, between the objective scientific knowledge and the kind of internal experience. Um, the uh, in the in the concept of the clock, you're sort of looking down. You can plan out. You can think about the future. Think about the past. You know, you can you can make a schedule for next Tuesday. Um, but in one's experience, you're just in whatever hour it is, and uh, it's it's always the present moment. Um, so time doesn't have a big place in the witness. I think that audio log is less trying to say something about time than just trying to call attention to the weirdness of the fact that the witness uh, doesn't deal with time as one of its themes. Um, but it has a bit to say. So, I might... I'll have to see how long this video is. Maybe I'll have to break it up. But there's one more thing that's worth discussing here uh, in this in this wonderful and sort of lonely area at the edge of the map here from these early people that first kindled the curiosity for that transcendent... Uh, that transcendent... Uh, uh, desire for, for understanding, um, and that is the presence of a hardcore late game vault over here. It's going to be the next one we crack open, even though it relies on mechanic. Now, of course, uh, just like the Burke vault, but more so, this uh, vault does not re rely on a re reflection mechanic. It relies on a mechanic from completely on the other side of the map. Um, so... Uh, so, again, the early player who's exploring what Jonathan Blow called the easy side of the island would not be able to get into here. Um, and there's, I think, a specific reason why why this mechanic is used. Um, oh, here, by the way, you can see the, the orange positive space versus blue negative space thing that I was referring to. Um, but uh, uh, but the, the uh, Feynman quote in here is uh, is very... Uh, he represents a philosophy and an aspect of the game, which, uh, which I think is, uh, which is he's he's sort of aligned with this specific mechanic. As weird as it to say, uh, this tetromino puzzles we'll talk about it later is, uh, is so it's it's the the most extreme towards the kind of logic uh, syntax. Uh, everything is just like a on the panel for you to figure out um, that, uh, and, and Feynman's worldview also is 
sort of on an extreme position of a spectrum of worldviews that the game explores. Uh, one last thing to note is, of course, this is also a little bit like that. Those, uh, it's got a hexagon in every single square, so it's calling back also to the completionist puzzles that we saw in the castle. And uh, one final thing to note, it appears to be, I suppose this isn't a shipping crate, uh, I don't know, some kind of, it's, a, it's an unusual structure, it's not ancient, like the James Burke sculpture, it was put together not by the ancient people, but by the same archaeologists that strung up all the lights and puzzles inside the, uh, inside the sun temple. Alright, so, we'll keep track of that. And then I suppose we will head over there, and we'll just dive right into the Feynman video. Uh, this might be a long video, but uh, that's okay. You can pause, you can come back to it later. You know, if you uh, haven't already uh, uh, noticed this, there are um, there are highlights in the YouTube uh, description. And so if you're not in the mood for like a epic two-hour, like, leisurely long play, then you can go down there and click around, and I'll uh, link you to what I consider to be the most interesting and edifying parts of the video. And then you don't have to watch me being stuck on all those puzzles. But if you're still with me, we're going to go hardcore, because the witness is hardcore. So we're going to watch this Feynman video and talk about it. So, by a backhand and upside-down argument, was predicted that there is in carbon a level at 7.82 million volts, and then experiments in the laboratory with carbon show indeed that there is. And therefore, the existence in the world of all these other elements is very closely related to the fact that there is this particular level in carbon. But the position of this particular level in carbon seems to us, after knowing the physical laws, to be a very complicated accident of 12 complicated particles interacting. So I used to illustrate by this example that an understanding of the physical laws doesn't give you an understanding in a, a sense of a understanding significance of the world in any way. The details of real experience are very far often from the fundamental laws. There are, in a way of speaking in the world, we have a way of discussing the world, which you could call, a, we discuss it at various hierarchies or levels. Now, I don't mean to be very precise, uh, this, there's a level of another level and another level, but I will indicate by describing a set of ideas to you, just one after the other, what I mean by hierarchies of ideas. For example, at one end, we have the fundamental laws of physics. Then we invent other terms for concepts which are approximate, who have, we believe, the ultimate explanation in terms of the fundamental laws. For instance, heat. Heat is supposed to be the jiggling, and it's just a word for a, a hot thing, is just a word for a mass of atoms which are jiggling. For all that, fundamentally, we should think of the atoms jiggling. But for a while, if we're talking about heat, we sometimes forget about the atoms jiggling. Just like when we talk about the glacier, we don't always think of the hexagonal ice snowflakes which originally fell. Another example of the same thing is a salt crystal. Looked at fundamentally, a lot of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But we have this concept, salt crystal, which carries a whole pattern already of fundamental interactions, or idea like pressure. Now, if we go higher up from this, in another level, we have properties of substances like refractive index, how light is bent when it goes through something, or surface tension, 
the fact that the water tends to pull itself together is described by a number. I remind you that we have to go through several laws down to find out that it's the pull of the atoms and so on. But we still say surface tension, and don't worry when we're discussing surface tension of the inner workings always. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Go on, up in the hierarchy. With the water, we have the waves, and we have a thing like a storm. We have a word for storm, which represents an enormous mass of phenomena. Or sunspot, or star, which is an accumulation of things. And it's not worthwhile always to think of it way back. In fact, we can't, because the higher up we go, the, we have too many steps in between, each one of which is a little weak, and we haven't thought them all through yet. And we go up in this hierarchy of complexity, we get the things like frog, or nerve impulse, which you see is an enormously complicated thing in the physical world, involving an organization of matter in a very elaborate complexity. And then we go on, we come to things, words, and concepts like man, and history, or political expediency, and so <laughs> forth, which is a series of concepts that we use to understand things at an ever higher level. And going on, we come to things like evil, and beauty, and hope. Now, which end is nearer to the ultimate creator, or the ultimate? or if I make a religious metaphor, which end is nearer to God? Beauty and hope or the fundamental law? I think that uh, the right way, of course, is to say that the whole structural interconnections of the thing uh, is the thing that we have to look at, and that the sequence of hierarchy, that all the sciences and all the efforts, not just the sciences, but all the efforts of intellectual time, are to see the connections of the hierarchies is to connect beauty to history, is to connect history to man's psychology, the man's psychology to the working of the brain, the brain to the neural impulse, the neural impulse to the chemistry, and so forth, up and down, both ways. And today we cannot, and there's no use making believe we can, draw carefully a line all the way from one end of this thing to the other. In fact, we've just begun to see that there is this relative hierarchy. And so I don't think either end is nearer to God's. And it's to stand at either end and to walk out off the end of the pier only, hoping out in that direction is the complete understanding, is a mistake. And to stand with evil and beauty and hope, or to stand with the fundamental laws, hoping that way to get a deep understanding of the whole world with that aspect alone is a mistake. And it is not sensible either for the ones who specialize at one end and the ones who specialize at the other end to have such uh, disregard for each other. They don't, actually, but the people say they do. So. <laughs> but that actually the great mass of workers in between, connecting one step to another, are improving all the time our understanding of the world, both from working at the ends and working in the middle. And uh, in that way, we are gradually understanding this connection, this tremendous world of interconnecting hierarchies. If you expected science to give all the answers to the wonderful questions about what we are, where we're going, what the meaning of the universe is, and so on, then I think you could easily become disillusioned and then look for some mystic answer to these problems. How a scientist can take a mystic answer, I don't know, because the whole spirit is to understand. Well, never mind that. Any, I don't understand that. But anyhow, uh, if you think of it, though, I, the way I think of it, what we're doing is we're exploring, we're trying to find out as much as we can about the world. People say to me, are you looking for the ultimate uh, laws of physics? No, I'm not. I'm just looking to find out more about the world. And if it turns out there is a simple ultimate law that explains everything, so be it. That would be very nice to discover. If it turns out it's like an onion with millions of layers and we're just sick and tired of looking at the layers, then that's the way it is. But whatever way it comes out, its nature is there and she's going to come out the way she is. And therefore, when we go to investigate it, we shouldn't pre-decide what it is we're trying to do except to find out more about it. If you say, but your problem is why do you find out more about it? If you thought that you were trying to find out more about it because you're going to get an answer to some deep philosophical question, you may be wrong. It may be that you can't get an answer to that particular question by finding out more about the character of nature. But I don't look at it. My, my interest in science is to simply find out about the world. And the more I find out, 
Uh, it is a light to find out. Uh, there are very remarkable mysteries about the fact that we're able to do so many more things than apparently animals can do, and other questions like that. But those are mysteries I want to investigate without knowing the answer to them. And so altogether, I can't believe the special stories that have been made up about our relationship to the universe at large, because they seem to be too simple, too, too, too connected, too local, too provincial. The earth, he came to the earth. One of the aspects of God came to the earth, mind you. And look at what's out there. How can he, it isn't in proportion. Anyway, it's no use arguing. I can't argue it. I'm just trying to tell you why the scientific views that I have do have some effect on my needs. And also, another thing uh, has to do with the question of how do you find out if something's true? And if you have all these theories of, of the different religions, have all different theories about the thing, then you begin to wonder. Once you start doubting, just like you're supposed to doubt, you ask me, is the science true? We say, no, no, we don't know what's true. We're trying to find out. Everything is possibly wrong. Start out understanding religion by saying everything is possibly wrong. Let us see. As soon as you do that, you start sliding down an edge, which is hard to recover from. And so when the, with the scientific view, or my father's view, that we should look to see what's true and what may, be, may not be true, once you start doubting, which I think, to me, is a very fundamental part of my soul, is to doubt and to ask. And when you doubt and ask, it gets a little harder to believe. You see, one thing is I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything, and there are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything to ask why we're here, and what the question might mean. I might think about it a little bit. If I can't figure it out, then I go to something else. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't, have to, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things by being lost in the mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell, possibly. It doesn't frighten me. So that's a complex video. Uh, more complex, certainly, than the, than the James Burke uh, sort of intro tutorial video. Um, and, uh, and we're going to think about it. We're going to talk about it. Um, so one thing that I realized uh, in the uh, after after doing the commentary in the James Burke video, uh, James Burke was a kind of historian who did this TV show Connections with the BBC. Um, but uh, Feynman's background is uh, important to discuss for anybody who who just is like who's this guy in the video. Um, so Richard Feynman was uh, was a, a sort of genius physicist um, in the 1940s and 50s. Um, who uh, was uh, significantly involved in the Manhattan Project? He didn't. He didn't have any leading position, but he was just one of the many people, one of the many physicists, uh, who was involved in uh, in uh, working on the atomic bomb uh, in Los Alamos. And he also made a lot of uh, really important uh, kind of breakthroughs and and uh, contributions to the development of quantum mechanics, not uh, not the early stuff when they were like first figuring out like what quantum mechanics is, but all the, the long process of figuring out all the particles, like what are these neutrinos, uh, how does the quantum mechanics relate with relativity, and how does it uh, tie in with, uh, you know, the strong force and these other forces. Um, the uh, Feynman is famous for these Feynman diagrams uh, that are like a a way of uh, calculating uh, sort of visually, almost almost in a way that resembles the puzzles of the witness. You can look up some Feynman diagrams, or maybe I'll uh, put a link in the, in the description. Um, but, uh, so, that's Feynman's background. He's a very esteemed uh, physicist, and also, as you see, has like a very uh, totally unique, uh, bubbly personality, very comedic, um, also uh, sort, of, sort of childlike, which we'll talk about later. Um, 
So that's Feynman, and another important thing to know about Feynman, and perhaps to know about Jonathan Blow, uh, I'll get out of this theater now, is, um, is that as important as Feynman is to the witness, he might be even more important to Braid. Uh, so Braid, as a lot of people know, has this kind of atom bomb uh, symbolism. Uh, I don't think that Tim, the character, uh, he, Tim isn't supposed to be Feynman. If, if there's any real-world character that kind of lines up to Tim, it's closer to, uh, uh, a little bit closer to Oppenheimer, maybe kind of a blend of Oppenheimer and, and people like Feynman, but, uh, but mostly Tim is his own character. It's not like Tim is secretly Oppenheimer or something. But anyways, um... <laughs> So to have uh, Feynman in this in this quote talking about uh, at the very beginning of the quote he's he's talking about carbon and electrons and he says well we've come to understand this thing about carbon but it you know even after understanding these these deep physical laws when you get right down to the the most fundamental pieces of our knowledge it kind of seems like it's just these twelve different random variables that are interacting and that's the reason why carbon has the the amazing properties that allow it to give rise to life and like that, you know, it's just 12 numbers that doesn't fill you with, like, this amazing uh, light that suffuses your soul or something. Physics, he's saying, uh, knowing that fundamental physics doesn't, even though you know something that's fundamental to the universe, in your head it's just 12 numbers, or, you know, it's just all these equations that you've learned, and it doesn't transform your view of life, um, which might feel obvious to some people, um, <laughs> It uh, wasn't that obvious to me when I was majoring in physics, <laughs> um, but uh, and it also wasn't that obvious in uh, in Braid, where where the protagonist Tim. That's the second time I've gotten caught on this tree. Um, where the protagonist Tim is uh, is very physics oriented. There's a couple of uh, physics references. I mean, you can go read about the atom bomb references, or you could play my mod Braid more now than ever, which uh, uh, kind of elucidates some of the plot points, tries to kind of clarify and yet expand upon the story of original Braid. But, uh, anyway, so so in Braid, uh, the, the princess has this somewhat similar uh, to to the kind of uh, sun symbolism and, and to the themes of the witness, but it's more oriented, it's more external. It's less about this internal conscious awareness. Um, it's more about, uh, like, like the princess represents this knowledge about the universe and this access to the to the secrets of the universe and the secrets of time. Um, so to put Feynman, who's a little bit of a, a hero of Braid, into the witness and have him say, hey, knowing all this physics isn't going to change your life on a fundamental level. It's not the secret to to this transcendent experience that you're after. Um, is is kind of a big turnaround from Braid. It's a little bit of a repudiation of uh, of Tim's philosophy and of the philosophy of uh, Braid. So um, so that's that's sort of interesting. But then Feynman spends most of the time talking about uh, uh, talking about this idea of hierarchies and of building up from uh, physics to chemistry to biology to psychology to uh, these sort of abstract uh, ideas that people have to our kind of biggest and greatest uh, mysteries um, of, as he says, evil, beauty, hope, God, um, and maybe political expediency. Um, so, the um, certainly the notion of hierarchies is uh, is very familiar to the witness. I mean, we just spent the time going through here, seeing how each little puzzle is introducing its own new ideas. It's uh, it's over in this in this reflection uh, in this uh, little ancient mural here. There's there's a panel that is representing the act of representation of the reflection of the sun on a panel that's supposed to catch the reflection of the sun. Um, there the, there's color symbolism here, the orange and blue that mirrors and calls back to the symmetry area with the yellow and cyan, um, and. Uh, there's just there's so many hierarchies going on, and of course there's the hierarchy which is which is ever the duality which is ever present within the witness between the panel puzzles and the environmental puzzles, which are more direct uh, experience calling attention to to vision and awareness as opposed to this kind of scientific knowledge and process of hypothesis testing and uh, and working things out that's in the panels. So there's hierarchies upon hierarchies, and there's dualities within dualities. Um, so it's a, a natural topic of conversation for uh, for Feynman, and, and I think 
that a big part of this video is just laying out that idea, making sure that people who are playing the game are kind of on the same page as the game, of understanding this this concept of of why is the fundamental knowledge important. You can you can kind of build up from it um, and uh, and connect all of human knowledge, right? Just like Feynman saying that the two people who specialize in the different areas, the, uh, the scientists on the one hand and sort of the philosophers and the, and the authors and the artists and uh, things on the other hand, shouldn't be totally off in their separate worlds. They should, they should respect each other and they should combine their ideas, right? The witness is thinking, we're not just gonna, it's, it's not like we're gonna build a better particle collider and that's gonna tell us the meaning of life. Um, we need to kind of bring all of human knowledge together. Um, and so Feynman is advocating that using this model of hierarchies and uh, connecting things, and as he says in a line that's uh, super suitable for the witness, draw carefully a line all the way from one end to the other. Um, because, as Feynman says, neither end is closer to God, right? So that fits, fits very well with this duality that the witness is always expressing between the, um, the kind of uh, first-person conscious awareness and, um, and the kind of... Uh, piece together scientific uh, knowledge of uh, categorization. So, but on the other hand, there's also some differences. Feynman is not just a, this, this perfect guy who's embodying everything good about, about the witness, um, and we'll certainly see that in the later audio, uh, sorry, the later recordings that we'll find in other vaults scattered throughout the island. Um, there are some that, uh, that, that represent a, a viewpoint that's, that's um, uh, on a different end of the spectrum from Feynman, um, and I, so I don't, I don't think Feynman represents like some kind of midpoint or something, or he's just explaining the philosophy of the game. Um, he, he does, in some ways, he's laying out the themes of the game, but in other ways, he does represent a kind of extreme view uh, that that needs to be balanced by the other side of the dualities in in the witness. Um, so, for one, when he's talking about these hierarchies, it's uh, he never leaves that super categorization way of thinking. He, he, the vision he kind of lays out is, well, we're going to take all this human knowledge, we're all going to kind of plug it together like, like in, into Google or something, you know? And then when we put it all together, like all of the pieces, right, like all of these puzzles, we're going to connect up all these puzzles. And then we're going to get, like, physics is going to light up, and it's going to go, ching, you know, and then we're going to get chemistry is going to light up, and it's going to send the laser to the mountain, and then we're going to have biology light up and send the laser to the mountain, and psychology is going to send the laser to the mountain, and they're all going to meet up there, and then something incredible is going to happen. But as we know uh, from the from the sort of, uh, uh, from the, the Castle Secrets episode, that, and just from the design of the witness, um, that slow path of progression, right, is is just is just one, you know that's that's still on the side of hierarchy, categorization, taxonomy, duality, and the side of non-dual uh, kind of uh, immediate realization, uh, that kind of flat non-hierarchical direct perception uh, is is also represented by by uh, other uh, by other uh, endings to the game. Um, and uh, and that so so this this notion that Feynman has of tying together all of the different uh, fields and uh, and drawing carefully a line all the way from one end to the other, in a way, it's it's analogous to what the witness is talking about. But Feynman is still kind of trapped in that world. He's not really able to see the other end of that spectrum. He's still in the world all about talking about these different sciences connecting up. And you can see that when he talks about his biggest ideas, evil, beauty, hope, man, history, um, that these big picture ideas, they're still, they're just big, they're big concepts, but, uh, but the witness is so interested in, uh, in, in consciousness and in experience and in uh, kind of the, the mystery of existence, of, of why things exist at all, um, and why there is this kind of meaning and value that and, and reality that, that pervades our, our lives. Um, and when Feynman talks about those big ideas, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not clear if he's, it's not clear to what extent he's, he's connecting that with that kind of uh, meditative conscious experience. And it seems like, like the big ideas, they aren't, 
you know, they aren't on the other side of the wall of paradise. They're just, it's just you put a bunch of bricks together, and then you made a bigger idea, um, like, like putting these bricks together to make the temple. Um, so there's like a very subtle difference there, which is, which is very befitting of, uh, of The Witness, which is a very subtle game, and also very befitting of Feynman's philosophy, which is like hierarchies of hierarchies of hierarchies. Um, so that's interesting. So it's introducing the theme of the witness of building a bridge from one end to the, uh, the other, but at the same time, Feynman represents uh, kind of an extreme position on on one side of that bridge uh, that kind of isn't quite seeing over to the other end of that bridge. Um, so, uh, and by the way, that footage is in black and white. Now, of course, obviously it's in black and white. Jonathan Blow didn't do that. Uh, it was just filmed a long time ago. But um, but there are there are some uh, fans out there. And uh, I, I don't know if this is true or not. I don't know if this is intentional, but it, it's certainly the fact that the video is in black and white. Black and white we associate with, remember, that tutorial zone of separating the black and white tiles. Um, uh, the black and white is, is associated with that kind of uh, with ideas of duality and of uh, building, a, building a bridge between two things, but also all of the categorization and separating off uh, things and dividing them and piecing together that scientific knowledge. Um, so uh, so then we get that second part of the Feynman video, which is now in color. Uh, make of that what you will. Um, and he's talking about religion. Uh, and he's talking, um, he's, he's kind of, he's rejecting the, the kind of simplistic, uh, 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 basic ideas of, of religion, of, you know, like that the universe is just a, a play put on, you know, and, and, and God put us here so that we could fight between good and evil, and Feynman's saying, look, like, you know, we're just one planet in the universe. Uh, it just, it, it doesn't line up with what we know. Um, and I think that's in there uh, for a reason that might not be quite what you think. So you might think that that's in there to show that Feynman is such an extreme perspective that he's not, he's not really understanding the religious side or the meditative side, but I think it's in there more to show, to draw a distinction. The witness is saying, hey, this is a game about the the incompatibility about Kusa's wall of paradise. This is a game about um, about that that somehow crossing that distance or or reconciling the, the distance between um, between these two worlds that seem incompatible. What it's not about is your classic science versus religion debate. And that there's a podcast in the very late game that's more explicitly about that. Um, but it's not about, you know, this isn't like a bunch of like atheists arguing with creationists or something. You know, that is like loud and kind of obnoxious and not very subtle and not very intellectually sophisticated on either side. Um, and that's not what the witness is interested in. So when Feynman is, is giving that kind of rejection of, of religion, it's, it's two things in that color footage. On the one hand, he's rejecting the simplistic religion, but then he pivots to, to uh, some kind of more, uh, more, more positive statements, and he's describing all these questions about why can humans do all these things that animals can't, and you know, where's our place in the universe? It's this very charming, uh, childlike, wide-eyed personality, um, super curious. Um, and I think both of those things, the rejection of the simplistic religious stories and the kind of extreme childlike uh, scientific curiosity represent uh, what the witness considers a start, uh, sort of like right at the ending of, of Braid, um, right, a bit of a transition moment where, where um, Tim realizes, perhaps like Feynman, that the physics knowledge of, of, of the princess, or at least his ability to perceive the princess, right, uh, which is very limited, um, is uh, is just giving him this this uh, basic. Uh, it's it's not that life changing moment, or he doesn't have access to that kind of life changing transcendence through the physics knowledge. Um, and he starts he starts putting together this castle out of stones, the different ideas connecting them up. You know, starting to go in this more witness style direction. Um, and uh, and he says, well, you know, what he's got now is an acceptable start. For, for building the castle, which at the in Braid is a silver lining to the end of the game, but uh, in in the Witness, I think you know this this uh, uh, the Witness is laying out Feynman's philosophy in that color footage at the end as uh, kind of the beginning of the journey. Even though you might think that it's the end because you know Feynman is such a brilliant guy and uh, and it's uh, but but this area here, right? This whole zone 
represents that early that that dawn of civilization right like the Egyptians and the Sumerians and what were the things that characterized them first of all um, they uh, like I noted they had they had a, a sense of mysticism and spirituality but these early people in the witness even though they kind of had sun worship um, they they were they were going for the goal as I said from day one their their religion is sort of correctly aligned so even from the very start the witness says at the beginning of this journey we're already leaving aside like the, the kind of like uh, uh, the obviously discountable religions that are just telling you these implausible local stories and things like that like uh, so so that's part of the journey is like discarding the myths of the past the witness is saying that's step one like you're not done when you got there that's where you start um, and then the other thing that, that uh, more obviously comes at the start of the journey is that scientific curiosity, right? These people who, who lived on this corner of the island, they built this thing to study the stars. Um, they were like Kepler and Newton described in that audio log. They had that cosmic religious feeling, which was pushing them to that first stirring of scientific knowledge and of, uh, of putting together these hypotheses and understanding the world there and probably hard to do uh, hard to do astronomy when the sun is always in the same place in the sky and it's always daytime but um, but that initial curiosity is also I think what the witness is saying that's the start of the journey that kind of spark that leads to um, everything else that we see on the island later um, and uh, one, one final thing that's uh, more of a minor note ending the episode is um, Feynman also says later on that he's, he's uh, interested in doubt and he's against that sort of dogmatism that gives you 100% certainty. He says, like, you know, I'm not frightened by not knowing things. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is, like, how did you get to know? <laughs> like, how, how do you pretend to have 100% certainty in anything? Um, because in science, there is no 100% certainty uh, ever in any theory. Um, if, if only because, you know, your senses could be, uh, diluted and, and, you know, maybe you're living in a simulation or something like that. So, um, and any theory could be overturned by more, more evidence. Um, but, uh, but that also, that's the final little hint that the, that the game is saying Feynman is still representing this extreme position because he kind of can't see out of that world. Um, in the world of science, you have all of this knowledge of which nothing is 100% sure. Like, you know, there's always a chance that you slightly misinterpreted what, you know, what Jonathan Blow was, uh, was going for with one of those puzzles or something. Like, you thought you believed in a, 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 a compatible version of the rules, but, but, like, if you made up your own puzzle that extended the rules, then, and Jonathan Blow made up his own version of the puzzle that extended the rules, there's always a chance that there would have been uh, a difference there. So, so in scientific knowledge, um... Nothing is ever certain, but as we'll see in the in the later videos, uh, where uh, you have people like Rupert Spira talking about uh, meditation and um, and awareness, um, f they bring up a kind of knowledge which which they say uh, reasonably about which we do have certainty, which is sort of the only thing that we're certain of, which is that Descartes, uh, I think, therefore I am, um, that that fundamental knowledge that something's happening uh that i have this world and this awareness um so that uh, that difference between the scientific world where there's so much little pieces of knowledge but nothing's 100 percent certain versus that the uh subjective world where there's there's kind of just one piece of knowledge which is absolute bedrock um is yet another reflection of yet another reflection <laughs> of the themes of the witness um so with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it wasn't too long. Um, and uh, I hope you'll be around for the next one. So I'll see you then.